Welcome to The Idea Space, a podcast devoted to sharing strategies and tools to help you make your dream life possible. I'm your host, Jen Liddy, a teacher turned entrepreneur. It's my mission to help women grow their businesses and get what they want without feeling guilty, overwhelmed, or confused. If you're tired of your ideas spinning around your mind and you really want something more for yourself, you're in the right place. Learn how to create the space to make your ideas a reality. I promise if I can do this, anyone can. Let's go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's interview. I am focusing on leadership this month in my content because I've talked to so many people who either don't see themselves as leaders or who are burned out leaders or who want to move into leadership but are kind of stuck around what does it mean to be a leader? How can I be a bit better leader? And I think it's interesting to talk about leadership as we move into the you know, high, high level of election season. So let's talk about leadership. And when I looked around my group of colleagues and friends, the person who stuck out to me was Laura Pris. Laura is a leadership coach. She's an executive coach and she's a speaker and she speaks to strengths of leaders. She really understands leaders from the inside out. And that's why I invited her today to talk to us. So Laura, thank you so much. I know we're going to be talking about some foundational things about leadership and some aspirational things about leadership. So I'm really glad you're here. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. I'm excited (laughs) to have the conversation. Yeah, we always have good conversations. So let's get started. Well, let's dive right into it. I want to know how you define a leader and leadership. Let's start there. What does it mean to be a leader? So my personal philosophy is that leadership is not about title, position, power, or authority. Mm -hmm. If you rely on those things, the people around you will do just exactly what they have to do within the confines of why ever they're with you. So if that's a job, it means they're going to do what they have to do to get their paycheck and go home. Leadership to me really truly is earning the right to influence people. And you get to do that when you show up as someone of high values, integrity, character. They know they can trust you. They know that you're going to follow through and do what you say you're going to do. And your agenda or your interest is not just getting what you can for yourself, but in fact, making things better for everybody. Okay, now that, now that you've said that, I, I have another question. Anybody can be a leader. You can be a leader yeah. in your own home. You could be a leader of all the librarians. You could be a leader of a Fortune 500 company, right? Like leadership Absolutely. does not mean that you have to be in charge of like 3,000 people or no. 20 people. No. no, in fact, at the very least, you are leading your life. <laughs> and whether you're in that official position somebody is always watching you and they're looking at you as a role model for certain things. So, so at the very least, yes, you are leading your own life. You're leading your family. You may be leading a group of friends and you know, that influence may be as simple as, you know, Hey Jen, I just read this really great book on emotional intelligence. I think you'd love it. I think you should read it. And if you choose to read it, you have allowed me to influence you, right? Right. But it could be at the other full spectrum of we're going to build this new company to do X, Y, Z, whatever inspiring vision you have. And that's the whole gamut in between. Okay. So we have to be a little gentler with ourselves when we think of ourselves as leaders because it's not necessarily hierarchical. It's not necessarily male, female. And I want to talk a little bit about you, you've already hit on the qualities of a leader, you know, being in integrity, being Mm -hmm. trustworthy. But what else does a really good leader have to be or do? Really good leaders are highly emotionally intelligent. And what I mean by that is very self-aware. So someone who understands, recognizes, can articulate, these are my values. These are my core beliefs about who I am, who you are, how the world works. They understand their personality, their style, their temperament, their preferences around communication, taking in information, all those things. They know what their strengths are and they know what they're not good at and they're okay with it. They understand, you know, their, how culture impacts their view of the world and how they show up. There are a lot of facets of this emotional intelligence, but once you gain that deep self-awareness, 
it creates this other awareness. So you can see the people mm -hmm. around you ever so much better and you recognize one size does not fit all. So I could approach you, Jen, in one style to meet you where you are. I could talk to Bill in another way or Mary in another way. So I can adapt my style to get better outcomes with different people. This reminds me of a lot, it was a while ago, but I had this epiphany that there are some people in my family, I might be married to one of them, um, who, are, who are highly, highly, highly introverted. And I, I didn't understand the difference between being an extrovert and an introvert. I thought extroverts were friendly and introverts were shy. That's all I understood about it. I didn't understand that it had to do with how the energy of the world yes. affected you and that you know, extroverts kind of process everything through their mouth and they get energy from being around other people and introverts need to recharge. So this mm -hmm. is probably a good 15, 18 years ago, I, I learned this. And so this is kind of speaking to your self-awareness because once I became aware of myself as an extrovert, then I could become aware of my husband as an introvert yeah. and meet him where he was rather than constantly judging him and comparing him against my metrics of being an extrovert, right? Right. So this, is, this one little, like, huge, I, will, I won't even say it's a little shift. It was a humongous shift in my life. But this is the kinds of things we want our leaders to be able to do is to know themselves so that they can then know other people. Yes. So serve the people that they serve in a better way. Yes. Absolutely. That's, you are spot on. That, that makes so much sense. I don't know that leaders are terribly good at knowing themselves very well. Not all leaders, right? Like the exceptional yeah. leaders are really good at that. So can we talk a little bit about the mistakes that leaders do make and how it affects them? Yeah, so one of the things that I've experienced over too many decades in business <laughs> is that oftentimes we promote people into a pitch position of management or leadership based on their technical expertise. So maybe I'm the best engineer, or maybe I'm the best accountant. And when the manager position comes open, I get promoted for that. Mm -hmm. But nobody prepares me for what does it mean to actually lead people? Because now this is an entirely different playing field, right? right. The dynamics have changed, the nuances have changed, the expectations have changed. So I think one thing is that we don't prepare people coming up for those leadership roles. And the thing about it is, I think everybody can learn to lead, but not everybody enjoys leading. Oh, that's interesting. It's an entirely different skill set. And, and a lot of people will find themselves thinking, oh, I want the promotion, I want the manager role. And they get it because it's a little more status, a little yeah. more money, maybe yeah. more benefits or whatever. But then you get in there and you recognize business is simple, but people are complicated. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you know, they come with emotions and baggage and they're irrational and they have insecurities and unspoken needs and all this stuff. Right. And so some people don't want to deal with that. Maybe I just want to do the engineering, right? But now I'm in this position. I have no preparation. We don't always train people to do it well. We just assume they're going to figure it out. Right, right. And there's no way for me to step back if I realize it's not the role for me. Oh, because our ego would get in the way. Well, and, and companies don't really make it comfortable or easy for you to do that, right? Okay. So it's awkward. Um, I think another mistake we make, in my experience with leaders, is that we think everybody sees the world and experiences it and takes in information and makes decisions and has the same strengths we do. And so we get this little tunnel vision of, you know, this is how it is, and you need to be like me to be successful. Right. But when you get into that space, then you're missing all this other information, all these other styles, all these other nuances and perspectives that you're missing. I think we often expect everybody to, to just get us and understand us and figure out how to work well with us. And so one of the things I work with my leaders on is, you know, Jen, I want you to sit down. We're going to write your Jen Liddy operator's manual. And we're going to explain to people in very clear, concise language how to best communicate with you, how you tend to make decisions, what your strengths are, what you're not good at, so where you'll need help and support, you know, all of those kinds of things so that our people can get up to speed with us faster than doing the trial and error and trying to guess and figure it out. It's like that invisible manual, you know, yeah. 
if you've ever had a best friend or a partnership or a spouse or you know even like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you get into these partnerships with other humans and you expect them to understand your <laughs> invisible manual that you've never given them. Yeah. What a gift it would be to give the people around you to know this is how I like to communicate instead of taking years to figure it out of trial and error. What a gift. Yeah. So how do good leaders do that without saying, okay, everybody, like, here's how I communicate, or here's how I like you to apologize to me. Like, how do you, how do, you <laughs> do that? Well, you know, once you take the time to actually be able to articulate those things, and I've got a tool that I've developed that walks um, my clients through that one step at a time, okay. very crystal clear. We spend a lot of time in exploration and discovery so we can then communicate it. You can make just a one-page document, really. And anytime I, I tell folks, if you take on a new role, you take on a new team, or even just a new team member, mm -hmm. you sit down and you have a getting to know you kind of conversation, uh -huh. right? Let's get to know each other. And here's my shorthand, right? Here's that is so normal and not weird at all. That yeah. is like, <laughs> oh, it doesn't have to be weird. <laughs> no. Oh, that's and, great. It's, and people love it because you've just made it easier for them. They've got the shorthand. These are, this is how I do it. You know, like I had a boss one time when I had a corporate job and when you would walk into her office, you couldn't miss it. She had this little plaque on, on her desk. It wasn't big. It wasn't obtrusive, but if you were looking at her, you couldn't miss it. And it said, be brief, be bright, be gone. And she that. wasn't, she wasn't being rude. It was just her style was, I just want the facts. Tell me what's going on. What do you need from me? What are you doing about it? When will we be done? Go away. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. And let's get back to work. Right. Yeah. So it made it ever so much easier. And then I would know if there's really a lot more context stuff that she really does need to understand, then I would schedule time with her to mm. sit down and, and she would have the mindset then for the bigger story. But it's just, you know, it's like I have been joking with a lot of the women in my circle who, especially through COVID and being home with their spouses all the time, they're like, oh, he's driving me crazy. And I keep joking that I'm going to start teaching this class called Decoding Your Partner's Secret Language. <laughs> yes, you should right? do that. <laughs> you know, so it, it really is a way to go faster, to have smoother relations, avoid a bunch of conflict, avoid a, avoid a bunch of misinterpretation, miscommunication, misunderstandings. And when you say, you know, I've taken the time to kind of figure out my shorthand, but let's talk about you. Yes. Let's talk about your styles. Let's talk about your preferences. Let's talk about what yes. you need. You it's know, brilliant. So together better, faster. Wow. It is so mind blowing to think about it doesn't have to be weird. It doesn't have to be awkward. It doesn't have to be all about me as the leader. It can be about us and it can be then about you because people always want it to be about them, right? Like it's, right. it's, that's what people are mostly interested in. So this, this mistake that we're all making as leaders is that we're not letting people, we're not giving them the shorthand to know us. We expect them to figure it out over years and years and years of working together and miscommunications and missteps and, and hurts and all of those things. Mm -hmm. mm. That's amazing. So can we talk a little bit about strengths? I know this is, you know, a strength of yours. <laughs> how do we find our strengths so that we can tell, tell them to people and work with them? So, you know, obviously there are a couple of ways. You know, one of the things is doing the assessment, right? There's an official online Gallup or Clifton Strengths assessment, which is scientifically, scientifically based, research-backed, valid, reliable. Barring doing the actual assessment, though, there are a couple of other ways that we recognize our strengths. One of them is that we have flashes of brilliance about something. So, for example, let's say we have this latent talent. We have some natural hardwiring talent to be a good guitarist. So as we're picking up playing the guitar, we're learning it fast. We have kind of flashes of brilliance about how it works and how to learn it faster. We get into flow. Mm -hmm. We have fun. We have high quality results. And time just flies, right? You know, so you can kind of make note of those things. Or when you have developed a strength, it's the things that you do all day, every day in an integrated fashion without even thinking about it. It's the stuff that just flows through you. And your colleagues and your friends and your family, they come to you and they say, Jen, 
I got to figure this out and I need some help with my messaging. Will you help me do that? Because we recognize this is an area of giftedness for you. And so the things that people keep coming to you and asking you for over and over again, they're not doing it just to be nice. They're doing it because they know you do it well, right? We, so those we, are a couple ways. Well, I wanted to stop here and ask you, because what I notice is when we have strengths and they are like breathing to us, they flow through us so naturally, they're easy. We don't give them credit. No. We just forget about them. We're just like, oh yeah, I can do that thing. And then we don't give ourselves credit. We don't see the value that we're bringing. Is that something yeah. that your leaders and your clients struggle with? Not seeing oh yeah, I, I think that's, I think it's a common, a common illness, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about strengths is, and this is research scientifically based, they've done the brain science on this. So we're each born with natural talent, which means a, oh, what is it? The ability for recurring thought behavior or attitude, I think, about something that can be productively applied. So we have this latent talent, right? And we build it into a strength by adding knowledge, skill, and experience mm -hmm. over time, right? So it's like the 10,000 hours of mastery concept. Right. And as you know, when you invest that kind of time, effort, and energy in something, it does just start flowing right through you. And because it comes so easily to you, we do discount it. We think, oh, yeah, that just, you know, it flowed right through me. I didn't no really have deal. to work at that. Yeah. But we discount all the time and effort and energy we took getting to that place of mastery. And we often tend to think that, oh, you know, anybody can do this, right? Yes. But not anybody can do it. You literally have a 1 in 33.3 million chance of somebody having the same top five strengths as you do wow. in the same order. You are really, truly uniquely made. Wow. So let's just stop here for a second. And if somebody wanted to do their strengths and find their top five strengths, where would they go? Um, I believe it's Gallup Strengths center.com okay. or you could even just google clifton strengths finder and take the online assessment great thank you for that so let's talk about what what happens then when people don't recognize their strengths as strengths they also think oh i have these weaknesses and i'm just going to keep working on the weaknesses until they become strengths which we both if you can't see laura right now she's shaking <laughs> her head vehemently so let's talk about weaknesses <laughs> we have to recognize our weaknesses and realize there's probably somebody else out there that that's a strength for that yes yes <laughs> yes so there's the way i teach this and and think about this for a minute businesses all over the globe every day are talking about strengths and weaknesses, right? You got to shore up your weaknesses. You need to fix these things, right? And every time we have a performance review, they say, oh, Jen, you're amazing at these three things, but you're not so good at those two. So you need to fix them. Yes. Well, it's wasted time, effort, and energy. So think for a minute, shift your perspective to professional sports, okay. right? The general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates is never going to go to his star pitcher and say, hey, John, you're an amazing pitcher, right? You've got the hook and the slider and the curveball. Nobody can touch you on the mound. You rock. But you really are kind of crummy in right field. So we're going to put you out in right field for a while and let you <laughs> fix that, okay? Right? And, and you're doing what everybody does when I teach it this way. It's ridiculous. But right. we do it in corporate America all the time. So here's the thing. Everybody has things they're amazing and brilliant at and things that they're not so good at. There's another concept that people stop and stare at me for a minute when I say this, but two thirds of weakness is strength misapplied. Mm -hmm. And you you're it? overusing it okay. or you're underusing it. And this is a whole masterclass all by itself to okay. help you understand how we get to that place. But one third of weakness is really, truly stuff we're just not good at. And the thing is, it's, it's stuff we can do, mm -hmm. right? Like I can do my bookkeeping, mm -hmm. but it takes me all day. I feel like I have to pull the top of my head off, twist my brain around in a different direction, put it back on. I spend the whole day reading the notes from my accountant and trying to do manual journal entries. And at the end of the day, I'm still not confident. Mm -hmm. I got it right. I haven't had fun. It's been frustrating, right? I send this stuff to my bookkeeper. She's done with a month's worth of stuff in less than an hour, and it's correct. 
right? So when you have stuff that is a weakness, a lesser strength, you can do it, but you won't have flashes of brilliance. Mm -hmm. You won't learn it quickly. You won't get into flow. You won't have any fun and the output will be questionable. Yeah, right? right. And you'll be exhausted at the end. Yeah. And frustrated. And so the thing about it is, is instead of making well-rounded people, Jen, fix your weakness. Right. Why don't we let you be the amazing superstar you are in the area where you're brilliant and build in tools and systems and collaborative partnerships around you. So you do what you do really well. I do what I do really well. And we're together better. I love it. I have a question about how people misuse this information. So back in the day when I was a high school English teacher, I had a boss. He was in charge of all the humanities, right? So he was the curriculum guy. And he liked me and he would let me do whatever I wanted. So if I wanted to teach honors, if I wanted to teach uh, the regular regions kids, whatever I wanted to teach, I could teach. He did not like one of my colleagues. And her specialty was teaching the honors kids and the AP kids. She wanted to only work with the really brilliant kids and she was really good at it. I frankly found the honors kids and the, and the really brilliant kids super annoying because they were grade grubbers. Give me a regular <laughs> regions kid any day of the week. I'm like, I can meet you where you are and get you where you need to go, right? But what he would do is he would kind of leverage his power and his leadership to not give her the classes that she would shine in. And it was a way of kind of punishing her. I don't even know if he was aware he was doing it, right? And then it, of course, created division because the, my colleagues would look at me like, why does Jen get to teach whatever the hell she wants to teach? Why don't I get to teach what I want to teach? But more importantly, like the kids weren't getting the best teacher for the, the class that they were taking. So I feel like there's a, a there are times when maybe leaders do this, um, you know, intentionally, and maybe they do it unintentionally. But um, I don't think giving people tasks that play to their strengths is a bad thing. And I feel like there are leaders out there who act like, oh no, we have to we have to fix your weaknesses. You have to come up a little bit, and so we're going to give you these tasks that you're like not going to thrive in. Have you ever seen that happening? Yes, everywhere, okay. all the time, <laughs> okay. every day. Okay. Yes. It, and, and in fact, I experienced it, you know, one of the last corporate jobs I had, you know, I was on fire for developing people and anyway, and we didn't have an organizational development person officially. And so whenever those kinds of things would come up, I would get excited and I was like, Ooh, I want to do that. And I had leaders who would deliberately look at me and say, no, we're going to mm. give it to Hannah or we're going to give it to John or, you know, and I'm like, and Hannah and John are both sitting there going, not oh, me. <laughs> you know? I don't want to teach the honors kids. <laughs> so yeah, you know, you're speaking to significant and far too common dysfunction. And there are a lot of different reasons for it, right? It might be that the leader is totally clueless and doesn't recognize the, the havoc they're creating. Right. It might be that they're on a power trip and they think it's fun to twist people around like puppets. Um, it might be because they're insecure. And they feel like they need to be the leader and they yes. need to, you know, set the rules and set the framework. And, and this goes back to one of the things you asked at the beginning, truly confident, emotionally intelligent, self-aware leaders build leaders, right? Mm. And they look at their team and they recognize everybody's gifts and strengths and they draw that out of them and they create teams and project frameworks and stuff where everybody gets to do that. And they also recognize that there are certain times where we're all facing a challenge or a situation that I'm not the expert in, right? but you might be, right? And so really confident leaders will say, you know what, in this situation, Jen is best equipped to lead us through this. So we're going to follow her lead. You know, if you need anything, go to her. I'll be here to back her up. And it's not a... It doesn't make me any smaller. It doesn't make me any less. It just makes me smart enough to recognize and allow the talent around me to lead when it's appropriate. So Laura, as an executive coach, do you ever struggle with people who are kind of their, their ego is racked by the fact that they need an executive coach or by the time people get to you, are they so aware of the problem that they know how much you can benefit them? 
You know, I've been on both spectrums of that. I've been hired to work with people who are on performance plans. And, you know, it's like fix this in 30 days or find a new job to, you know, you're a high potential and we really want to grow you. And so everything in between. And I remember distinctly walking into this is a global company. You would recognize it if I told you the name. I was working, starting with 12 of their top leaders, and I ended up working with about 100 of of their leaders at all levels. But this guy walked into the meeting like this. Arms crossed. I know who I am. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing, and I don't need your help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was very arrogant. My way or the highway. I know what I'm doing. I've worked my way up here. I deserve the next promotion into the executive level. And so I worked with him for a while. And the next time I had a conversation with the executive team, they said, you know, if we're just looking at skills and experience, he's the next person to get promoted. And I said, well, you need to think about that. You know, if you want dysfunction and command and control dictatorship kind of leadership in your executive team, then go right ahead. But if you really want to feed the culture that I see you trying to build, he would be the last person I'd promote. We ended up working together off and on at various levels of depth for about two years. And as I was getting close to the end of my contract and all the stuff I had agreed to do for them, he came up to me one day and he he says, Laura, what are you doing next? You know, when will you be back? And I said, well, you know, Joe, I don't really know. You know, we've kind of finished the scope of work that I've been working on. He said, well, I'm going to tell them they need to bring you back because you're making a huge difference. Whoa. And I was like, oh my God, can, can <laughs> I pick up my phone? Can I, can I, can I record that? <laughs> like I, I literally almost fell off my chair, Sure, but it was just so rewarding because he was so set, mm-hmm. but something along the way sparked him to be willing to consider a new perspective and to consider that he didn't know at all. That's amazing because I know those people. I've seen those people. I've worked with those people and they are very hard to thaw. So it's, it's quite a testament to your ability to get in there. So my last question is, does everybody have the ability within them to become a leader? And why should we want to become leaders? I think everybody has the ability. Absolutely. I'm, there is so much around leadership that e- is easy to learn if you're motivated to do it right. And I don't think a leadership position is for everyone, just like I don't think going to a university is for everyone. We all have different talents. We have different skills. We have different motivations, things that set us on fire. So if you have the desire, the motivation, the heart, the compassion, the awareness that you truly want to dive in to the messy space of leading people, then absolutely, you know, but do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Learn about leadership, learn about people, learn about yourself. If you're not motivated by that, don't feel compelled to take on those roles. You know, it's okay to say, I love doing what I do. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to move into that space. Yeah, leadership sounds like Knowing yourself first and liking and knowing, uh, liking knowing other people, right? It really is less about strategy and much more about the people who are going to put the strategy into play. And one last thought on that is that there is no one perfect model of leadership, right? right? We all bring those nuances and personal talents and skills and perspectives to it. So if you choose to lead, whether it's just leading you in your life or leading a team or leading in the community, do it as you. Mm -hmm. There is only really truly one unique you on the planet for all time. And if you don't bring you to the table, we're all missing out. That's such a great piece of advice. Thank you. Where can people follow you and learn more about you? I know you're pretty prolific on LinkedIn. Yes, I've been, I've been posting videos on LinkedIn. You can find me there, Laura Prisk, easy enough. I'm on Facebook, not as often. I have a podcast, Making Space for Conversations That Matter, that truly is just about having fabulous conversations with people like you. <laughs> and then you can find me at lauraprisk.com. And that's P-R-I-S-C, brisk. Yes. Sounds like brisk, but it's prisk with a P and a C at the end, so... <laughs> 
Laura, thank you so much. This is such a great way to kick off my month uh, talking about leadership. And you've given me so many great insights since I've known you about leaders, about strengths, about letting go of our weaknesses. Um, and and I, I think my favorite thing is deciding where you want to be a leader in your life because you don't have to always be the leader in all the places. And I think that's something that people with the quality of being a leader, they tend to always fall into leadership roles and it can be exhausting for them. Mm -hmm. It can. And so, you know, with that self-awareness, you give yourself time once in a while to stop and actually think, is this a space I want to step into right yes. now? And it's okay to say no. Yes, it's okay to say no. That's, that's a great piece of advice for me. So I'll stop <laughs> there. Thank you so much again for your time and your brilliance. I hope that people go check you out. And if they are looking for an executive coach, support and leadership. I highly recommend Laura. I know her personally. I have worked with her. She is quite brilliant at this. So thanks again. Thank you. It was fun to get to do what I do. It was. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the Idea Space in your podcast app and tell that friend of yours who needs some help getting where she wants to go. I'd be so appreciative if you left a review because then we can help more women create the space for their ideas too. Go to jenliddy.com forward slash free to grab the many free resources there to help you move forward. And I will see you next time. Bye.